uh, okay. So if interest rates are higher, you have uh, essentially higher uh, uh, purchasing power over your lifetime because you have access to this better uh, rate of return. So if uh, interest rates are stochastic, you will want to edge against interest rates going down. And you can do that by buying long-term assets because the value of long-term assets is going to go up uh, when interest rates go down. And therefore, the capital gains will offset part of your loss uh, uh, of uh, investment opportunities. We are going to find in the model that uh, older investors are going to care less about this because essentially the aging demand will decrease with age because as you get closer to death, you don't care so much about uh, the rate of return on your wealth because you have uh, a smaller number of periods of compounding. And then you're going to have substitution effect from the background asset, just like in the typical model where we try to match the equity share. If uh, human capital and social security have their own duration, uh, if they are long-term assets, they're going to reduce your demand for long-term assets. If background assets are short-term assets, they're going to increase your demand for long-term assets. So with this model, what are the facts that we try to explain? Uh, so just clarifying uh, point, uh, they're useful during seminars. All of this is partial equilibrium, so we will not try to understand prices. We just want to uh, understand uh, who buys long-term assets and why. So what are the facts that we're going to try to explain uh, with the model? We're going to try to explain why is it that the rich essentially have more long-term assets, why the high earners have long-term assets than people at the bottom of the uh, income distribution. And we will try to explain why uh, wealth inequality kind of follow the level of interest rates in the time series. So before I go through the model, I just want to show you the stylus facts that both motivate the paper and the stylus facts that we're going to try to explain with our model. So there is a lot of unpack in, uh, uh, in these graphs. Uh, so what uh, this graph shows you is the interest rate sensitivity of uh, wealth. So basically it tells you if interest rate go down by one percentage point, by how many percentage points does your wealth overall, including your liabilities, net of your liabilities go up? And so we do this graph as a function of age. And for three subsamples that uh, are basically a uh, fair side of earnings conditional on your age. So there are several, uh, and we kind of like give you a representation of what part of the balance sheet drives this duration by stacking the different assets. So basically we start from the lowest duration asset and we add uh, uh, sequentially uh, assets of higher duration in the order of their duration. So there are uh, two messages from this graph. The first one is that you see this unshaped relationship between age and the duration of people's wealth. And this is true regardless of whether you look at people at the bottom of the earnings distribution or people at the top. So that's our first message. The second message is that at any point in, uh, in, during the life cycle, people with higher earnings are going to tilt their portfolio toward long-term assets more than people that are at the bo bottom of the earnings distribution. So this uh, red line, uh, this black line, sorry, shows you uh, the duration for the uh, uh, median uh, tercile. And therefore you can see that clearly the first tercile has much less duration than the second one, and the third one has more duration than the uh, second one. So that's the second fact that we will try to explain. So that's as a function of earnings, you can also within an age group, so this is around uh, 40, 45, you can also see a very uh, uh, strong relationship between the duration of wealth and wealth itself. So people that are more wealthy also tend to invest more in long-term assets. Where is this coming from? Well, you can see that it's coming largely from like the propensity to buy stocks, which tend to be long-term assets, or the propensity to have private equity in your, in your portfolio to, to be basically to be a, a business owner. So that's our third fact. Uh, then our fourth fact is that this relationship between uh, duration and wealth kind of depends on your definition of wealth. So you have this positive relationship when you define wealth the traditional way, but if you were to include your uh, social security benefits, the parts that you have already accrued, then this relationship would look very differently. 
And so that is kind of related to our previous paper. So this is coming from our paper about social security wealth, where we try to measure uh, how much people have accrued social security wealth. And so here we're just computing the, the duration, and we find that it basically inverts, inverts the relationship. So in our previous paper, we find that wealth inequality increased over the last 30 years because interest rates were going down, and the order of long-term assets that enjoy the capital gains are the rich, and so therefore you had a, a, an increase in wealth inequality. But once you consider social security, it doesn't look that way anymore. You don't see this increase in, in wealth inequality because there was uh, there were very large capital gain on uh, the annuities that social security represent, which is a very long-term asset itself, which represents a huge part of the portfolio of people at the, uh, in the lower part of the earnings distribution. So that is related to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the last fact that we try to explain, which is the very strong relationship in the time series between the level of interest rate and the level of wealth inequality. So in this graph, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the uh, share of the wealth that go to the top 10% of the distribution. And on the right, you have a one minus uh, the uh, yield on a 10-year uh, real uh, uh, bond. Okay, so the model, so it's a relatively st uh, stylized model. So we are going to have constant relative risk aversion and a bequest motive. Uh, you're going to make a portfolio choice between two assets. Either you buy a coupon that pays in one year, so that's a totally risk-free asset, or you can buy a n-year coupon. And basically, by mixing those two coupons, you can get whatever exposure to duration that you want. The return on your wealth is going to be the return on the risk-free asset plus a premium that depends on the realization of the shock of interest rate. Because even though the coupon that you receive in, let's say, 30 years is totally safe, its valuation is going to change when interest rates change. So if interest rates go down, the present value of this coupon is going to, uh, to go up. So that generates some risk in, uh, in your portfolio. So here we only care about those two assets. So they are supposed to capture the optimal duration for your overall balance sheet and we abstract from like the decision to buy equity versus bonds or the decision to buy a house or not. What matters for us is just the optimal duration of your portfolio. And so this is uh, uh, how wealth is going to evolve. Wealth is your new wealth is going to be your former wealth plus your labor income plus social security benefit minus taxes minus consumption, and you get a, uh, the return on your wealth once the shock to interest rate is realized. Uh, how will interest rate uh, evolve? So for the one year interest rate, we're going to assume an R1 process and the persistence of this R1 process is going to determine how a change of the one, on the one year interest rate is going to move the entire yield curve. We are going to assume, which is consistent more or less with the last 10, 15 years of data that there is no uh, term premium, but anyway, what we are really interested in, we are assuming that those coupons are perfectly safe in real terms. So that's also uh, a reason why we assume no term premium. So what's the rest of the model? So it's it's pretty standard. So we are going to have stochastic uh, a stochastic income process. So you might be will not be entirely safe. What's very important for us is to describe the social security system accurately. And one of the very important properties of social security is that it offers a much higher replacement rate to people who had low li uh, lifetime earnings. So that's what makes social security a progressive system. And that's going to be important in the uh, design of your optimal portfolio. Then we are going to have uh, income tax on earnings and benefits. And finally, we will have a bequest motive. So you want to leave wealth to your children but the amount of wealth you need to leave for, to generate a certain flow of utility is going to be higher when interest rates are low. So the way we think about it is that you don't want to leave a house of a certain value. What you want to leave is a house of a certain size. And because the level of interest rates affects the, the, the value of the house, you're going to need to basically leave more wealth if uh, interest rates are low. 
Okay, so what is the, in, uh, the economic intuition behind uh, the model? So to uh, to show you the economic intuition, we're gonna uh, solve the model uh, analytically in the case when we don't have the bequest and there is no income risk, just to convey the intuition. So the optimal investment in the long-term asset is going to be determined by uh, two forces. So the first time you all recognize is just, you have a risk-free asset, you have a, an asset that has some risk, and therefore you have an optimal a portfolio share that comes from the Merton model, which is just the premium on this asset divided by risk aversion and the variance, the volatility of, uh, of returns. So we are gonna shut that off because we are going to assume no term premium and so therefore there is no uh, uh, incentive to, to take that risk. The second uh, part of the equation is the part that we are interested in, which is the edging demand against interest rate risk. So it's this idea is that you want to hold the long-term asset because it's going to give you capital gains when uh, investment opportunities get worse because interest rates are going down. Uh, we can rewrite uh, this equation, assuming that the first term is zero, and then what the agent would like to do, more or less, if gamma goes to infinity at least, is to set the duration of their wealth equal to the duration of their consumption plan. Because if you do that, you can maintain the same consumption plan regardless of the evolution of interest rates. Because essentially the cost of the, cons the present value of, of your consumption plan is gonna move exactly like the value of your wealth. So that's only if gamma is equal to infinity and you want perfect edging. So there is another interesting case, which is gamma is equal to zero. When gamma is equal to zero, you actually don't want to buy the long-term asset at all. If if, if anything, you would want to short it as much as possible. And here's the intuition is that there is a complementarity between wealth and the rate of return. If, if you could, you would want to have seeds when weather is going to be good. And here it's the same idea. You want to receive wealth in the state of the world in which you can reinvest wealth at a very high re rate of return. And if you buy the long-term asset, the opposite will happen. You will have more wealth when the rate of return is low. And so if you're totally risk neutral, you don't want to hold the long-term asset. For gamma equal one, you have like this uh, traditional result that those two forces offset each other and you are myopic. So we are going to be uh, typically interested in cases where gamma is greater than one. So this rule, is going to apply, so just like to be clear, this is when we have no earnings in the model and no social security benefit. Sorry, sir. the Zoom thing is, uh, is over the title. Uh, what happens if we add social security and we add human capital? Then basically you're going to target exactly the same optimal exposure, which is the red term, pi star, but for your overall wealth. So you're gonna say my overall wealth is a mixture of my financial wealth, my human capital, and my entitlement to social security, and I want the, my duration of my financial wealth plus the duration that I get from human capital plus the duration that I get from social security divided by my total wealth to be equal to this target that I found in the case where I only have financial wealth. So those are just dis describing pure substitution effect. If I rewrite the equation, I get that the optimal duration for my financial wealth is the optimal duration in the model without background asset plus substitution effects coming from human capital and social security. So typically if human capital is higher duration than my target, then I'm going to buy more short-term bonds in my wealth portfolio. On the other hand, if you, uh, human capital is short duration, like when I get closer to retirement, then human capital, because it's short-term, will incentivize me to buy more long-term assets with my financial wealth and social security will have the same type of substitution effect. We can also rewrite this equation directly in terms of the interest rate sensitivity of, uh, of the wealth. It's basically the same logic. So quantitatively, what does it look like? So on this panel, I show you just the value of the different components, wealth, human capital, social security benefit, over the life cycle, the unit is the average wage in the economy. So as you can see at the beginning of your life, you must, you have no wealth, you have a lot of human capital, 
you have a lot of taxes to pay, sadly, and uh, benefits are uh, far in the future. So these are the duration of each of those components of your balance sheet, of your overall balance sheet. So human capital is likely, so in black, you have the target duration in the model without background assets. So this is what you target for your overall wealth. That's the black line. That's the optimal uh, duration for your wealth plus your human capital plus your social security benefits. So as you can see, at the beginning of the life cycle, human capital is relatively long-term. And so it's going to generate a negative demand for long-term assets. Social security is something that you receive in retirement. So it's always very long-term. And so it's an it's a implicit endowment of a lot of long-term assets. And so it's going to push you towards short-term assets in your portfolio. And so this is a, uh, the result. So what you target is in black. But for your wealth, once you take into account the substitution effect, you get this M shape coming from just human capital. Because again, at the beginning, human capital being long-term reduces your uh, demand for long-term assets. But as it becomes short-term, it increases your demand for long-term assets. And then uh, it uh, reduces it as it becomes irrelevant. And social security, because it's always long-term, is going to reduce your uh, demand for long-term assets. And in particular, it's going to reduce the long-term demand for uh, uh, the, the, the demand for long-term assets for people who are at the bottom of the wealth distribution or people who are at the bottom of the income distribution. Why? Because in relative terms, they are much more endowed in social security benefits. Uh, okay, I don't have the time for this. Let me show you uh, the model fit. So, uh, we have a relatively standard uh, calibration that we take from other papers that try to match the equity share, for example, and we take the income process from a, from a recent government paper. And I skip that. So uh, this is uh, our fit for wealth. So that's just like calibrating the bequest motive and the discount factor. More interestingly, then you have our fit for the sensitivity of wealth to interest, right? And so we reproduce this M shape relationships that we see over the life cycle in the model. This is within an age group between 40 and 45. We replicate the fact that people that are higher in the earnings distribution should hold more long-term assets. And so are people that are higher in the wealth distribution. So why is this so important uh, to us? Why did we write this paper in the first place? Well, it's to generate this graph. So again, there is a, a big relationship between the level of interest rate and the concentration of wealth in the economy. But there is a uh, some kind of a philosophical question about does it matter that because interest rates are low, asset valuations are higher and inequality are higher. So in the model, if we do an OLG exercise where uh, we simulate cohorts using the actual path of interest rate since the 19th century, we can replicate this uh, V-shape of the evolution of wealth inequality. You can see that wealth inequality was going down in the model until the mid 80s and was going up afterward, just like we see in the data. In terms of magnitude, we can explain roughly half of what is going on in the data. In orange, you have a measure of welfare within a court, so it's welfare inequality. And so as you can see, the model is able to generate this variation, this long run variation in wealth inequality without any implication for welfare inequality. Again, I want to be careful, this is just for 50% of the variation in wealth inequalities that we actually see in the data. Okay, so conclusion. So we provide micro foundation for the cross section of the interest rate sensitivity of wealth. Uh, what's the, the basic mechanism? So people want to buy long duration assets in the model to edge themselves against uh, interest rate going down. There are strong substitution effects from background assets, human capital and social security that can explain relatively well the cross-section of, uh, of balance sheets. And our model helps not only to understand the uh, trends, in the long run trends in wealth inequality and how they are linked to the evolution of interest rates, but also to understand their welfare implications. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for coming. It's um, Daniel Greenwald in NYU.